Joining us today is a man who captained the United Kingdom at our first Diuro tournament and was our joint top scorer. He was cruelly ruled out of the second tournament with a horrible injury, but was still there adding his expert knowledge to our coaching team. Little known to a lot of people, he's also a part-time actor and has appeared in classics such as Last Christmas, Agatha Christie Death on the Nile, Spider-Man Far From Home, and has even got a role in the new Batman movie when it's released. He's also had his dress sense mocked, being compared to someone dressing like a rubbish art teacher. The original captain, leader, legend, it's John O'Tyrrell. You know what, John? JT's just texted me to say he can't make it. But not to worry, mate. I've lined up a replacement. Not just any replacement. A living legend. An inspiration to you and me. And to be honest, I can't quite believe I'm about to introduce him on the Diabetes Dugout. Because today, Peachy, we're joined by a man who has played for his country and your beloved Tottenham Hotspur, as well as flying the flag as the only tight one to play in the Premier League and for England still to this day. I'm sure you know who it is by now, and it's a huge honour to be joined by none other than Gary Mabbott, MBE. Wow. Well, John, glad to see you as well, sir. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. Is this this part of your phoning the elderly and just checking in on them? (laughs) Well, I wasn't going to say that until I saw you. No, but uh, <laughs> but no, I've uh, this year I did uh, had twelve calls this morning, so I started them at nine o'clock and finish at uh, midday. So sometimes they finished about twenty to twelve today. So I had a ninety-six year old gentleman who'd been a Spurs fan for like I don't know ninety years. He said, and uh, yeah, wow. some people who are living on their own, lonely, and so yeah, it's been a. In fact, I did my crikey to get a list of them. I started over a year ago, so I've done. Uh, 2,603 calls, so wow. there we go. Wow. So it'd be, be nice if I got paid a 10 pence <laughs> per call, but unfortunately... Uh... <laughs> oh, brilliant. Um, so, so Gary, what we'll, we'll do on this um, podcast is we're going to talk through a number of things. We're going to ask you some different questions. We're going to want to talk through your story. And obviously, with it being a focus around diabetes, a lot of the questions is going to relate back to... Uh, your condition and obviously your experiences within, within football. So I wondered if, to begin with, you could just start us off with that beginning point for you with type 1 diabetes, you know, tell us a little bit about that diagnosis story and, and what it was like being diagnosed back in the, the 70s. Yes, of course, it was all very different then than it is today. Um, still exactly the same condition. Uh were there any further towards uh, <laughs> finding a cure for it? Uh, I don't know, but certainly what has changed is that the the ease with being a diabetic, I think, is uh, easier now to some degree. Um, but uh, overall, when I was first diagnosed, uh, I was 17 years of age. Uh, it was just uh, unfortunately my uh, my parents had just split up, so. A couple of days later, uh, after my father had left uh, the family home, um, I was diagnosed with being a diabetic uh, and uh, straight, I was, uh, well, I wasn't diagnosed then, sorry, I started feeling all the symptoms, raging thirst, uh, going to the toilet all the time, all the classic symptoms of being a diabetic, uh, a bit lethargic, but of course I was a professional footballer at Bristol Rovers, um, and uh, it really felt, uh, you know, it was getting worse throughout probably the last the week before Christmas and after Christmas. And of course, Christmas time, you know, you're having more maybe sugary stuff as well. Uh, but of course, being a professional footballer, uh, you try and keep yourself in trim, but I wasn't feeling good. Uh, and then we played away on uh, New Year's Day away at Leicester City. Uh, I probably had the worst game I've ever had in professional football. We lost 3-0, came off at the end and the manager said, Look, Gary, I'm sorry, but for the next game, I'm dropping you. Uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm really not feeling well. So we got back to Bristol. I was then sent straight to the uh, club doctor on our return. And uh, he said, look, Gary, I think you're diabetic. You know, 43 years ago, I had no idea what diabetes was. Well, you had some degree, something to do with injections, but I had no idea myself. I went straight into hospital. Um, and then, of course, uh, the doctors came to see me and started talking to me and uh then one of them said, Gary, we don't think you'll be able to maintain a career in professional football. You're going to have to have injections every single day of your life. Uh, then as it was, it was urine test. You had to pee on a urine stick to try and get your readings. He said, trying to be able to control that you know, with a professional career playing 
two or three games a week, training two or three hours every single day, uh, is not going to be possible. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, I was very down. Um, uh, my family, my brother came to see me. Um, in fact, how lack of knowledge uh, people had about diabetes, my brother came to see me and he brought me two shoot magazines and a, bottle, uh, and a box of Maltesers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but again, um, my father then contacted uh, three of the top specialists in the world on diabetes and sports. All three of them came to the same conclusion as did the doctor in the hospital that no one's ever done it from a young age before and they couldn't really see it being possible. Um, so we didn't give up. Uh, my father contacted another gentleman and uh, he basically said, well, look, it's never happened before, but you know, if you're prepared to give it a try, then I, I, will, I will back you. So hence, uh, that's what happened. We worked out what had to be done prior to matches, half times, after games. And then uh, literally with, within, I think it was uh, four to six weeks, I was back in the Bristol Rovers first team. So, so yes, it was all a massive change to my life. Uh, and I think, you know, one thing I will say now is for, you know, I always say to mainly to youngsters with diabetes that, you know, diabetes, you know, is a condition that you can live with. So no matter what you want to achieve in life, you can still achieve it. But also what I will say is that you have to be so driven, so determined, uh, because everyone said to me, the doctor said to me, Gary, if you're going to go out after matches and drink with the players and be out all night, then you know, you've got no chance. If you don't look after your uh, proper food intake, your injections, and yeah, you've got no chance. So you have to be, as all everybody listening will know, you have to be so disciplined. Um, I mean, just been to such a degree that I think it was, and it's sort of a, uh, I don't like to say it to youngsters, but it's a bit of a, a downside, I suppose. But I was asked, uh, you know, not too long ago in a, again, a Q&A about my condition and life. And they said, well, if you had a chance in your life, you know, you've got one, you know, your final request of what you really want to do or what's on your bucket list, what would you like to add to it? That you could really... Uh, you'd really want to be able to do. And I said, to be honest, after 43 years to spend one day without diabetes, uh, just so that every single moment from waking up in the morning through going to you know, bed in the evenings, I mean, literally every, since that, everywhere you go, you have to make sure you've got the, the correct, you know, everything with you, your things. I mean, literally since 1940, sorry, 19, for 43 years now, um everywhere I go and literally in my pocket in my bags in my football kit bags in my match day suits everywhere and is in my <laughs> just got back from walking the dog in my pocket fruit pastels always go with me there we go all of us <laughs> we're here as well Gary don't worry <laughs> fruit pastels I I found dexasol tablets I found very difficult when I'm going low to actually yeah. get down and swallow <laughs> so fruit pastels have been I mean it changes with different people Mm. Uh, I can get straight at back. It was you broken up, <laughs> um, but no. So everywhere I go, in fact, I'm not, I've never been sponsored by fruit pastels. To be fair, I should have been. <laughs> um, but yes, but everywhere I go, obviously they're in my pocket. If I go out for a walk with a dog and I change jacket or something, and I get, you know, I don't know, twenty meters away from the house and I realize I haven't got them, I don't panic, but I have to go back and get them because, yeah, you, know, you have to be prepared. And as all everybody knows. Um, you know, generally you get warning signs, but then if it's a particularly hot day and you're sweating or whatever, and things have happened, you know, there are times whereby, you know, you may not identify it quickly enough. And throughout my time, you know, I've had, uh, you know, some, some bad experiences uh, like most diabetics have. Um, but as I say, overall for myself, uh, as a generalization, uh, as long as you take care of yourself, as long as you have that discipline, uh, which is vital, um, then I feel that uh, yeah, you can lead as normal life as anybody else. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Gary. Some amazing messages in there and what you've said there. I just wanted to take you back to the start. There was, you know, you talked there about some really difficult conversations with specialists telling you that, you know, the career that you've dreamed of, the career you've just started as a professional footballer with Bristol Rovers has, is, you know, according to them, 
needing to come to an end. So I just wondered how that made you feel, what sort of barriers were there to start? And then what, how did you go about going, you know what, this isn't going to stand in my way just because it's not been done before doesn't mean that I'm not going to be the one that goes and makes it happen now. Again, I think it was just more bravado because I had no real idea of what being a diabetic meant. Um, I was just thinking, well, surely something like this can't, you know, surely this can't stop me from doing what I want to do. Uh, but having said that, I was also, um, you know, when people tell you those things, you have to actually in your mind start to consider, well, what if? Um, I went to a grammar school, I came out of grammar school with five O levels. That was enough to go on to do A levels, but I chose to go into a football apprenticeship. Uh, so I knew that I had, I could have gone back because um, I only just basically the year before I left school, could have gone back and could have done A levels after that. But your whole life of being geared towards, you know, driving myself from the age of about seven or eight to you know, being in the back garden every single evening on my own with a ball practicing and practicing every single day, just so you could try and give yourself an opportunity of doing what you wanted to do. And I was just thinking of all that time I'd spent and suddenly uh, 10 years down the road, um, I'm being told that that's no longer possible. So I think it was youthful exuberance uh, that uh, refused to take what I was being told by who I you know, highly regarded as being the top specialists. But I thought, well, they said no one's done it before. Well, in my head, I thought, well, has anyone actually tried it before? I knew that uh, a player from Scotland, Danny McGrain, uh, had got it, but he got it towards the end of his career when he's in his 30s. Uh, but he still played, you know, for you know, a couple of years after that uh, with diabetes. Uh, but of course, going from a, uh, a teenage age, obviously, was going to be very different. But, you know, I took everything on board. Um, and when this gentleman said, look, if you're prepared to give it a try, I said, absolutely. Um, and then mostly we worked together very closely. And, uh, you yeah, know, it was uh, it was difficult at times uh, trying to work out you know what my pre-match meal was going to be, how I was going to have, when I was going to have my injections because then um, it was very different. It wasn't like you have one injection before a meal and then uh, you know you can change that all the time. Uh, this was basically then you had two injections a day, all you know the insulins were all mixed in together or two insulins, two injections a day and then one overnight. So it wasn't a you can have, you know, just one just before a meal or you know, just cut it out because you've got a football match today or doing something. Uh, it was all geared to two jabs a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. So, yes, uh, we had to do a lot of uh, trials and a few tribulations to get there. But uh, we managed to do it. I mean, of course, yeah, there was like every diabetic that's listening. There's always plenty of ribbing, uh, you know, we've back with the team when you're injecting yourself before games or whatever and, everything's going on, uh, plenty of, um, you know, you start in training, if you made a mistake in training, they say, oh my goodness, they take the mickey so quickly, get in some sugar, nothing to do with my blood sugar, it's just purely I made a mistake. Um, there were other times where I did go low in training, and of course, uh, when it first happened, there was a lot of concern, couldn't you get the doctor over, um, after about the fifth time it happened, oh, for God's sake, get in some Lucozade, you know. So, I think the biggest, uh, thing for me was my transfer from Bristol Rovers to uh, to Tottenham. Uh, that was only going to take place. Uh, they were very concerned about my condition. In fact, I'd already had, I'd been turned down by Ipswich Town. Uh, Bobby Robinson was the manager of Ipswich when I was at Bristol Rovers. Uh, he called me and said that they wanted to sign me. Um, and he said that they're going to sign me on the, this is on a Thursday. On the following Monday, they were going to make the deal go through. On the Saturday, we were playing away. I think it was at Carlisle for Bristol Rovers. I remember traveling back from that game thinking that'd be my last game for Bristol Rovers. Uh, the Monday came and nothing happened. So I was concerned. So a couple of days, nothing happened. So then anyway, my father in the end uh, called Ipswich and got through and spoke to the, uh, uh, the head coach, said, I'll pass you to the manager. And apparently I think they were, they were going to be paying, I think it was quarter of a million pounds. No, they're going to be paying, it was 75,000 pounds for me. And their board had uh, had turned it down, saying that they couldn't spend that money on a diabetic. So, uh, yeah, wow. you can imagine, hugely disappointed. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, again, carried on. And then at the end of that season, uh, my contract was coming to an end. And then 
uh, I wrote to all the first division clubs and again, being a diabetic or whether that's a reason or not could just be my play, but I only got two responses. One was from Aston Villa saying, sorry, can't even offer you a trial. And one was from Birmingham City who had Ron Saunders as the manager. And uh, yeah, Ron Saunders was a very down to earth, uh, you know, spoke as, uh, you know, as he saw it. And he spoke to me and said, I understand your condition, etc. but I think you could be a great asset to our team. Come and see me. So I traveled up to Birmingham, went to meet him at uh, it was St. Andrews. Um, had a long chat, went around the stadium, explained where he wanted me to play. Um, and I traveled back to Bristol thinking that, you know, I was going to be traveling to Birmingham. They were then in the Division One uh, to become a Birmingham player. And literally the following morning, I got a phone call. I picked the phone up and uh, it was Bill Nicholson on the end of the phone. Bill Nicholson was then the chief scout of Tottenham. Of course, uh, even then as a you know, youngster growing up, uh, they were a very famous name throughout football. And um, he said, look, Gary, I've seen you play a number of times for England, uh, England 20 words and England youth for, you know, for Bristol Rovers. I think you've got the potential to be a Spurs player. Um, do you want to come and have a chat? So, of course, absolutely. So I went up the following day to London. I remember when I drove in through the raw iron gates at uh, White Hart Lane, as it was then, I just knew that was the place I wanted to be. Um, Bill took me around the stadium. They took me up to the training ground. Um, I walked in at lunchtime with Bill and uh, all the players have finished training. They're all sitting there in the canteen. And so I walked through. It was just, it was quite remarkable because you know, everyone in front of me that I was looking at were you know, international you know, star players. Uh, I'd only ever seen them before, either on match of the day or on top of the pops. So, uh, you know, it was... Uh, Quite amazing to see all these players in front of me. Keith Burgershaw was a manager. I'm not sure if Keith Burgershaw really had seen me play, um, but basically I think it was Bill Nicholson's recommendation that uh, I was going to be signed. Uh, but Keith said, look, we want to sign you, but we have to have special uh, medicals done prior to doing that uh, to make sure that you're capable of surviving a, you know, your three-year that we're going to give you contract. So I had all those done, and uh, fortunately... Um, of course, you'd imagine my uh, the guy that I met in the first place. I was diagnosed with one that wrote the <laughs> the thing for Spurs, uh, saying that I'd be fine, uh, and I signed for Spurs. So, yeah, a, yeah, a remarkable turnaround. But again, um, I think one of the first things when I was diagnosed when I was uh, first diagnosed, they said to me, "Look, Gary, a lot of diabetics don't like opening up." They like it to keep it in the closet that they're a diabetic. What do you want to do? Because, you know, they said it, they believe it can affect their careers, affect whatever happens, promotions. And I said, I thought to myself, thought, well, I've got no problem with that. You know, it doesn't bother me in the slightest. Um, if I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. Uh, I never, I'm not a person that always, you know, blames other things, uh, you know, for your lack of ability in something. And um, so I said, no. I'm very happy for it to be released. So it was released straight away in Bristol then that uh, I was a diabetic and going on to injections. So everyone knew about it when I arrived at Tottenham. Um, and uh, I think probably the best thing for me was that I think there was a lot of concern still about my condition, but um, Keith Burgershaw said to me, look, Gary, we've got a, as you can see, we've got a team of star players um, and we believe you've got the potential to come through, but it may take you two or three years maybe to, you know, we will work with you in training to turn you into the player to, to be a, become a Tom Hospital player. And I was, I was happy for that. Uh, so I signed on that basis. Um, and then three weeks later, uh, we're on pre-season training, had a couple of injuries. So I went on tour with the team to uh, Norway. Then the second game in Norway, uh, we had a couple of injuries in the first game and uh, I, I was put into the first team for a pre-season friendly in Norway. And uh, I then stayed there for the next 16 years. So uh, the turnaround from joining from Bristol Rovers to making my debut for Spurs, I made my debut for Spurs in, in this country in the charity shield at Wembley against Liverpool, who were the then champions. We were the cup holders. And uh, suddenly I, you know, three, four weeks earlier, I was a Bristol Rovers player in the English third division. And suddenly I'm now playing against Liverpool, the league champions uh, at Wembley. So uh, an amazing turnaround. Yeah, absolutely, Gary. And something you said there, you were talking through your, you know, your uh, journey. You were, you said about 
you know the the attitude in terms of um being so open about it from the very start and how many people with diabetes find it challenging to to not open up it's some something that i struggled with in my life in my condition being involved in sport feeling some of those uh, barriers maybe within the changing room you know some of the mickey taking some of the um the ways people view diabetes it made me go inward so i can really resonate and i'm actually you know your example of you know how you're so open about it and you're open from the start has been and we're going to come on to it has been one of the biggest impacts on both myself and peachy from a from a young age but i just wondered you know from that perspective obviously it inspired me in the end i came i came full circle with it i eventually started speaking about what it's like to live with a condition um and that inspired the diabetes football community what we do now and to try and help others involved in the sport i just wondered whether you had any real big tips for you know becoming open dealing with some of the stigma and then whether or not you felt you know the attitudes that you faced around diabetes in the you know the early parts in the 70s and 80s in your career whether you felt that they'd changed much now now that we're in 2021 yes and i think obviously the education about diabetes uh how things have changed within you know, being a diabetic um have been immense uh you know, it was, you know, it was quite incredible, you know, originally from just having, you know, one needle stuck in some surgical spirit to suddenly now, you know, you have one tiny needle that you throw away every time after you've used it. Um, you know, then it was, you have to you know, pee on a urine a stick uh, uh, to get a, a reading that was nowhere near exact, but it was within a, re, you know, within a region. Um, so yeah, before every game, I was peeing on a stick. Coming at halftime, pee on a stick, then adjusted at halftime. Uh, there were a lot of things you have to do. As I said before, I think it's it's all about if you're if you're a confident person, if you believe in what you want to achieve, you believe you've got the capabilities of achieving it, and believe your diabetes will not stand in the way. Um, and I'm saying that, that from that perspective, I think it's very wise to be very open about it. However, if you're not particularly confident, if you're not sure about where you're going, if you're not sure about your abilities in the areas where you want to go, then it's even more of a reason to come out about it and to let everybody know about it. Purely because if you gain that confidence of knowing in yourself, your condition, you're on top of your condition, there's nothing your condition will do to stop you doing what you want to achieve. Um, I, during my playing days, literally it's been remarkable. I used to have to have two secretaries, one to do my football fan mail, and one to do my diabetes fan mail. Uh, just to get so many letters in from newly diagnosed diabetics. So this one person that answered all my diabetes ones, which, just, which were actually letters going back to people. Other ones were just from the football side, just signed pictures going back. And then um, after my initial, yeah, I basically said, played my first game for... Spurs in, uh, it was August 1982. And then in October 1982, I was selected for England to play at Wembley against West Germany, who just played in the World Cup finals. You know, suddenly your turnaround from being a, say, a third division player at Bristol Rovers to suddenly now you play in the English first division, you had a great start for Tottenham. Um, and then suddenly you're being selected for your country. Uh, and the best thing for me, and I think it always, it lasted for, a spell i think it's probably the first year i was at spurs it was always and in my time at bristol rovers you know gary mabbott the diabetic the diabetic footballer gary mabbott gary mabbott the diabetic signs for spurs and suddenly after playing for spurs england division one people see me on play it was just then gary mabbott everybody just accepted the fact they knew i was a diabetic but it wasn't an issue yeah and i think for most people that have diabetes you know, every youngster I go and talk to, whether it be a group of young diabetics, I tell them straight away. You know, some say, well, I'm scared at school. They have to have a biscuit and people take the mickey out of me. I said, yeah, but they'll take the mickey out of anybody for anything. Yeah, it's not just your condition. You know, if you have to have a digestive, enjoy it. You know, let them see you eating it. They can't have one, but you can. Yeah, make you, make you feel special. And everything that you're doing, you, know, you feel special in what you're doing. And, you know, don't, I mean... As I said, these letters I used to receive, and it used to be very difficult because I get youngsters writing to me saying, oh, my mum and dad wrapped me in cotton wool, won't let me go and play football, et cetera, et cetera. 
like other letters from mums and dads saying, oh, little Jimmy, he won't go, use his diabetes excuse not to go to school. He's got a test at school. He won't go because he's, you know, I think, you know, he's low. And, you know, it's, so you write back in all different areas, but it's important and it's vital that everyone with the condition, you know, lets every single person know about it. There will come a time and it will come no matter if you think you're the best diabetic in the world and, oh, I'm always on top of it. Believe me, it will give you a kick up the backside and you will need other people around you to help you yeah, and to, yeah, to get you through those situations. So i am always been very, very strong in the fact that, yeah, no matter what your feelings are and why you feel you shouldn't uh, yeah, be totally uh, you know, outward with it, be totally on top of it and make people realize that uh, you've got a condition, but that's a condition you can deal with and you can do whatever anybody else in this world can do. Yeah, so you kind of, you know, you came out there, Gary, you just went and proved that your ability would almost surpass anything to do with your condition. And, you know, you proved to the football world very quickly that diabetes wasn't going to stand in the way of your ability. And by being open, actually, eventually people just accepted that that was who you were and what, and actually then eventually when, you know, just Gary's a really good footballer and forgot that, that sort of diabetes stuff. And I know that John is one of those young men and young boys that would have written to you back in the day i, th I think well, I, I i hope i responded oh uh, well I, I thought it was you clearly now it was the secretary <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no every, every single letter that went out i read every yeah, single and, one of them so and i had to make, make sure that my secretary yes we we had a guideline for newly diagnosed you know youngsters this and that then so we had the guideline of letters but they were each done to that individual person. The person would write to me and they say, I was diagnosed when this happened and that happened. So you obviously you have to make it personal. So every single letter that went out, I, I read. And uh, so, yes, they, they were read by me and signed by me. Well, I, I always, I always remember there was always a, either like a little slip with it that you would have handwritten or uh, either a note on the, the letter that came back and it was always handwritten in your black ink. So <laughs> I, um, I always know it's, it's sad. I, I, I'm, I'm still a bit, um, I'm still a bit in shock, so apologies. I, I I didn't know that it was going to be you, and it's a bit like I can't believe I'm actually sat here talking to you. So. <laughs> no, exactly. But when I saw you initially, I was going to I was going to. Uh, that's why I had, had to say, great to see you, because obviously I knew that uh, you weren't going to be aware of it. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so, we talk about yeah being at Spurs and all those things, and yeah, there are many things that happen to people's lives. Uh, you know that that affect things, affect their decision making. You mentioned just now that uh, obviously telling people to you know, accept their condition and to go on to achieve what they can. It wasn't that before I could go on and become a player that I wanted to be, I initially had to prove to myself that I can deal with the diabetes, I can handle my diabetes, I'm on top of my diabetes, and no matter what happens in my career, Never, ever in my career can I ever say that it was my diabetes that stopped me from doing this or doing that. Or I had a bad game today. Oh, because I woke up a couple of times in the night. My sugars were a bit high. So I was, no, not once in my career will you ever see, not, you, not once did I ever, ever use diabetes as a reason um, as to why you, know, you didn't perform at the highest level at, on a particular game. I was quite lucky overall that I was generally quite a consistent player. Um, you know, so I was probably, ne I was never very rarely a player that had like a 10 out of 10, uh, but I never had a like four out of 10. I was always like a, you know, a sort of seven out of 10. Uh, and then obviously move around that area, but never, if I had an absolute stinker, uh, which, uh, you know, I could ever say that was down to my, my condition. And that's why I say to let everybody know about it, whether it be youngsters at school, in the workplace, in the sports arenas. No, be proud of being a diabetic and, you know, go out there and people will always, oh, Craig, he's got diabetes or this and that. No, go out and show to people, oh my God, I thought he would be struggling. No, that person, whoever it is, a person at school in the exams or whatever, they can achieve whatever they want to achieve. I think, I, I think that's absolutely spot on. And that's something that I've probably really only discovered in the last maybe five, maybe less than that years. And, I'm much more open about it now I'm a PE teacher in school so talking to students about it and I think it helps having the 
the, the technology on display. So um, with a, a CGM on display or, or my pump, and they're, they're able to see the wire and just o opening up conversations with students and, and they talk about it. They see that it's um, that you can still lead a normal life. And, and invariably, I've had conversations with students who have family members or, or know friends in their football team that they play at the weekend who are diabetic as well. And I think it's I think that's absolutely spot on. And, and it's something that I think that I, I, it's that sort of thing that I go, I, I wish I'd had that advice or I wish I'd been brave enough to do that. 10 15 even 20 years ago but it's um it, it's that it's that bit of advice that I, I i completely agree with and and completely um want to pass on now that's exactly people. john i mean the thing is you're yeah Chris, you, you're able now to to show people exactly that that's why it's uh it, it's vital that diabetics get on top of it and believe in themselves that they can do this you know we're human beings we all we always doubt ourselves yeah and if you've got an extra condition like diabetes or whatever you asthma or something else there's always even more doubt but the more doubt you put upon yourself the less you're going to be able to achieve and yeah i mean, as i said i've always been totally open about my diabetes i've never hidden it i've never tried to put it to one side yeah as i said to you earlier if i could be one day without being a diabetic i'd grab it but i've gone now for 43 years with every single day having to deal with it and throughout those 43 years, I, I, I've had quite a, quite a good time. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's always the downsides to it. There always will be downsides to it. But overall, um, has diabetes affected my life? Well, could it have made me, would I have been a, a better footballer without diabetes? I don't think so. I think maybe my diabetes may have, you know, been the thing that spurred me on, that, that forced me to prove people wrong, that I could achieve more. Uh, again, psychologically, you don't know, but positivity is vital. Uh, even in what, no matter what you do, whether you're diabetic or not. I mean, when I was captain of Spurs, you know, I never allowed negativity in my dressing room. You get players that had been left out of the team, and they come in and they'd be moaning about the manager, the player. And if that's the case, you guys just you know go out and train. Please don't bring that in here. Positivity is the most important thing, no matter what you do, whether it be overcoming diabetes, whether it be yeah, you know, whatever area of work you're in. Um, and as a diabetic, that positivity, yeah, as long as you, you know you're in control, know that if something's going to go wrong, you've got things there, people know about it that can deal with it. Um, yeah, you know, none of us ever want to feel vulnerable. I think at times diabetes can make you feel a bit vulnerable. Um, I had a case whereby uh, we were playing at home to Burnley in a League Cup game. And we trained in the morning go home for lunch have lunch and then you sleep in the afternoon get up go to white Hart lane for the game so i was in the team that night got home at lunchtime did my blood test blood test had come in then did a blood test and it read 16.8 i said oh, that's weird anyway so at my lunch time uh then you know, i had an injection then that was obviously bring me down a bit more insulin to bring me down to the correct level uh when you sleep in the afternoon and of course uh didn't turn up for the game. Uh, obviously, Ozzy Ardil is a good friend of mine. So Ozzy knew a neighbour of ours. He called the neighbour and said, look, Gary's not turned up for the match. They know that I'm always on time. Because that's another thing about being a diabetic. I am never late. Because if you're late, people think, you know, the worst. So I'm never late. I never let them start thinking about the excuse of you're a diabetic and he's, you know, had a problem. So I'm never, ever late to anything if I can avoid it. Um, and then, of course, uh, the police were called. They got broke into my house and uh, they found me in a coma in my bedroom on the floor. Um, so I woke up the following day at like six in the morning uh, in the Barnet Hospital. I had no idea what had happened. And of course, then you got to try and work out what had happened. And at the hospital, they went through all the different things it could be. And then, of course, my blood test machine. Now, my blood testing machine is one of the early ones, one of the first ones that came out. It was like a it was like a brick yeah. um and yeah it went everywhere with me to every game in my training bag my match day bag went everywhere with me and yeah they say you have to check every you know clean a bit you don't you get on with life and i did so it was there it was there I used it and of course did it they did the test at the hospital and uh it was giving me a reading of about um eight too high so my reading should have been 8.8 .8, and it was 16.8 
Um, and of course, I had enough insulin to bring that down to about eight. So that took me down to about zero, or, you know, there. So um, at least you could identify why it was. But as I said, you least expect it. These things happen. Yeah. You know? And yeah, you know, it was frustrating. It was annoying. I missed a game. Everybody knew I missed a game. The media were on top of it. Uh, she had to come out and do a press conference as to why it happened and explain what I just explained now. Uh, because every time, and that's been one of the biggest things that I've, I suppose, media-wise had to deal with, is that because I was lucky enough to be able to do what I did in the game as a diabetic, and everyone's following you, if you had a, a coma, a bad coma, suddenly it was like, you know, how come he's look at him? He's playing for Spurs. He's had a coma, and in fact, uh, it's a it's a true story. After that event, um, there were a number of firemen who were diabetics who were put on paid leave, were put on leave, as to because they were being diabetics and brought into the forces. Uh, as to you know, what if that happened when they were in a building? And you know, I explained. You know, I had to do it myself and working with the uh, the the union. I spoke to them, explained to all the people involved what happened. In going into a situation when you're awake, you know you can feel what's happening. Someone around you will know. You have a few glucose tablets or pastels, and you're fine. You know, before I do anything in my life, whether it be drive a car, do an interview, just before doing this, I did a blood test, so you know exactly where you are. People in the professions that they were in, police, other, whatever, they will be taking tests, you know, before all this happened. So anyway, within, uh, I think it took about three or four weeks, but the, the firemen were reinstated. Uh, but again, things like that had a knock-on effect. People would look at it and say, well, my son plays football. My guy just had a big coma. And did, my, uh, is that, no, it was just because of something that can happen due to your diabetes. But yeah, as I said, when you're least expecting it can give you a kick at the backside. But I've been 43 years of being a diabetic. I've had two bad comas, um, you know, where I had to be taken to hospital once after another England game against France, but it happened during the, again, during the night. Um, so yeah, uh, that's been quite frustrating. And I had to recently, I've had a, nearly lost my leg, had a leg bypass sort of you know, three, four years ago, had a heart bypass two years ago. Then uh, my foot got chewed by a rodent and the devastation from that and the damage to the nerves that I'm still dealing with. I can, I'm fine now, but I'm still on painkillers every day because the nerves in the feet were circulation to my feet is not great. Um, hence, that's why the blooming rodents were able to chew there and me not know about it. Um, but yeah, it's part of parcel. That's it. You have to accept it. I've got a great... Um, what I believe it's been good for me is that all of us suffer from problems in life. And if I've got a problem and I can deal with it, I deal with it immediately. If I've got a problem that I cannot do anything about, like being a diabetic or anything that happens, I can, I've got no way of changing it. I don't waste one second in worrying about it because all worrying does is bring you down even more. So if I've got a problem, I deal with it. If I've got a problem I can't do anything about, don't waste one second. I just put it to one side. You've got to deal with that, but get on with life. Because, you know, we all talk about psychology in life, uh, mental health issues, whether it be youngsters, sportsmen, workplaces, whatever, all of us, we all have mental health issues. And the thing about it is, is that, uh, you know, some are greater than others, but I've tried to work to make sure that mine are, Whilst they're all there and we had those issues and problems, they are not as great as they could be if I didn't have some of these things in place to help me get through. Have, have you ever had um, anything with any teammates who, who you feel have either judged you differently or have, have they all just accepted it? And, and you've obviously, you've played alongside some absolute characters. I'm just, straight away, I just think, how, how do you explain to someone like, like a Gaza who again, one of my heroes, w was he quite accepting? Did he, did he sort of take the mick a bit? Was there, did, or did, did he just completely understand it? Guys, I mean, I, I can't believe you asked that question. You've been in a dressing room. <laughs> you know the banter that goes on. Do you think they just let, let me go? No, no. absolute, absolute <laughs> this... disgrace. 
you know, they were hammering me all the time. You know, go every time you went through an air, airport, we going through, and they'd be you know gathered behind you and they go through the things. They got needles in his bag, needles in his bag, check them. <laughs> yeah, just carry on. Needles, check the needles. <laughs> you get you know, you'd be saying like that, you know, he's a junkie, go junkie. Yeah, so taking the Mickey all the time. We go to parties after matches, go in the bathroom, and yeah, you know, there'd be so yeah, you know, and or if there was not, yeah, you had to do an injection or something quickly, you'd try and do it, and then somebody would see it, and, oh, being at a party, are you, what are you taking? Yeah, have you got something for me? Um, you know, so yes, of course, the band is always there. Uh, yeah, I've been in, you know, Gary Lineker was my room partner at the time he was at the club, and we had you know, a couple of occasions whereby um, one after a match during the night, I went low, so uh, he's woken up, and I'm and I'm standing at the bottom of his bed, folding up all of his clothes. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. All you know, she, he tried to sort of chat to me, and I was like not responding. So we called the the physio. He came in, and of course, sort of low. And then we went on a um, preseason tour again. I think we we're in Sweden, and uh, it was Gary, I think Gary Nicker's first trip with us. So his first time we're sharing a room together, and so. We played a game. After the game, we got to the, the town. There was a meal put on for us, some drinks, party atmosphere. So all the chaps are there. Gary's gone back to the, uh, the hotel quite early. So, you know, after a while, I've gone back. Um, and I've got back, got back to the hotel room, gone in. Gary's in bed asleep. Um, now, the rest of the story now comes from Gary. He says, I came in and apparently I took off my jeans. I was dancing around the room with my jeans singing that current number one hit from Gloria Estefan, one, two, three, four, come on, baby, say you love me. <laughs> of course, uh, <laughs> Link, says, Link, Link said he, he woke up, had no idea what was going on. He thought, club captain, what the hell? He, he thought I was drunk. So he said, yeah, he said he sat there, and just watched me. And all I was doing was dancing around, carry on singing this song. And fortunately for me, Eric Torsfett, our goalkeeper, was going past the door. And he heard this singing going on. I thought, I, I party in here, knocked on the door. <laughs> and of course, Gary let him in. And before Gary arrived, I was Eric's room partner. So as soon as Eric saw me, he knew full well that I, you know, I was having a hypo. He, got, he said, Link, he's sleeping with me. He knew in my bag, I always carried the pastels, got the pastels out, sat me on the bed. You know, seven or eight pastels later, five minutes later, I was as normal as I am now. And Link just couldn't believe it. And he said, but man, he said, I mean, still, every time we still meet, he still winds me up about that occasion. He said, hold on a minute, can you just, just take it, you back a minute, Gary, he said. We're on our first trip together, our first night together, sharing room. I'm asleep, you come back from, and I think you're drunk, and you walk in the room, and I wake up to you singing, one, two, three, four, come on, baby, say you love me. He said, what am I supposed to think? So, you know, he had a, a good chuckle about it. Um, I mean, Gaza, when Gaza first arrived, um, our first away game, I'm not sure if it, I think it, was, it could be in Forest, I'm not sure. But anyway, after matches, let you guys know, you have a shower, get changed. Okay, we go to the players' lounge, have a drink with the opponents, then obviously on the coach for a trip home. Now, being a diabetic, as you all know, I have to have injections before my meals. So I never ever went to the players' lounge after a game, went straight on to the coach because us pampered soccer stars, we have a beautiful team coach. We have two chefs on the coach to cook us a four course meal on the way home with a glass of wine if we win, all very nice. So I go on the coach, do my injection. So I'm sitting halfway down the coach, got my needle out, got my insulin out, just pulling it into the vial and I clock Gaza getting on the bus. He's walking towards me and he's staring at me the whole way. He stops by the table and he goes, Mamsi, what are you doing? I, I said, well, Paul, I'm a diabetic. I have sugar diabetes. I didn't even try to explain to him what that meant. I think he thought sugar, he think that was a famous boxer, you know. I said, no, I said, I have sugar diabetes. He said, well, what's that mean? I said, well, I have to have four injections every day. He said, what? Well, just while you're a footballer. I said, no, Gaz. I said, after four injections every single day for the rest of my life. He went, four every day for the rest of your life. I went, yes. He said, cool, he said. They can't wait to die, can you? <laughs> I looked up and there was that Gaza grin. So no, I mean, yes, there are many, many, many stories. A lot that I can't tell, uh, but a lot of Mickey taking, a lot of ribbing, 
um, from fans as well. I got some awful abuse from fans. Uh, you can imagine in the days when they used to call you, well, I'm not sure if you can say the word now. Um, well, I shan't say it, but... Uh, I, I think you refer to it in your autobiography, don't you? Uh, yeah, well, that, that was when you were allowed to say it, probably. Yeah. Yeah, but bad bad words about you and the condition. And, yeah, they used to, it's told, and then, of course, there was a lot of you know, different abuse going on for everybody. I was just singled out for the medical abuse and being disabled, all that sort of, yeah, but a lot worse taunting, shall we say. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it's just, yeah, other players were taking flack for other things, flack that I was getting for it. Not once did it ever cross my mind as being an issue. If I ever heard it, I always used yeah. to turn around and smile at people. Uh, yeah, it never bothered me in the slightest. Um, and no, I mean, I can honestly say that I don't feel that I've ever been, I don't know, ever been really concerned or hurt or um, by anything that's uh, that, that's happened, despite there being numerous things that have gone on, um, on and off the field of play. And every person, every person watching this will be able to relate to me, I'm sure, because no matter where you are in life, there are always those characters that will do those certain things, take their mickey about certain things, do certain things. Um, but, you know, that's, that's what diabetics are. That's what, uh, it's part of our lives and the, what we have to live with. And as I say, most importantly, the, um, yeah, I suppose importantly I say, but I'm actually a tad frustrated because 43 years ago I came out as being a diabetic and I was really hoping that, you know, during these last 43 years, you know, there's, there's currently I think a diabetic um, England rugby player and other guys. Um what stands out as your your, your most favourite your, your most favourite memory and and was it made any more special through being diabetic? Um, again, it's a it's a great question. Um, I think probably my first game back with Bristol Rovers was quite an important one in the preparations and being able to get through a game and then saying, well, actually, I feel fine, um, but. As far as you know, sport-wise and achievements-wise, I think you know my first game for England, walking out at Wembley with the England shirt on and the England, you know, standing there in the lineup and singing the national anthems, and at that moment realizing that you are at that time one of the best eleven players in the country. Um, that was quite a, you know, an experience. Um, winning the UEFA Cup for Spurs in 1984. Uh, my first trophy for the club, uh, being part of that, again, was magnificent. Um, 1991, when obviously the last time we won the FA Cup, I was the captain and we got those steps at Wembley to lift the trophy. That moment where you turn and uh, lift the trophy and you share that moment with all the Spurs fans in the stadium around the world, that is an incredible. I think uh, if you ever see a picture of that and uh, I got the biggest smile on my face I think I've ever seen. So... Um, yeah, no, I mean, I've had some great moments. I think, and in fact, the BBC coverage on that day, so walking up to receive the trophy, uh, I think it's John Watson, as you said, Gary Mabbott, uh, you know, the only top diabetic footballer in the world, as it was then, walking up to receive the trophy or something. So he actually mentioned it as I was walking up to receive the trophy, which was great because that, that, those clips used to go worldwide. Um, so hopefully that would have had a, an impact. Um, so yes, uh, uh, yeah. As I say, I had some I had some phenomenal moments in my career, um, and uh, and yes, I mean I don't don't ever think well, crikey, I've achieved all this. Oh, isn't it great because I am a diabetic? Um, again, I've never I've never really linked being a diabetic in, in with all that to some degree. It wasn't something that yeah, was just on my mind every second of the day. Um, it was not on my mind as far as, you know, doing what I did. I mean, the cup final in 1991 had an injection at half time in that cup final. You know, all the, all the pressure, the stresses. I mean, as you'll all know, you know, you have a row with the wife and your blood sugars go up or down or, you know, everything can have an effect on it. The weather, 
uh, playing games in hot conditions, cold conditions, everything can have an effect. Big high pressure games, preseason friendlies, all react differently. I came in at half time in the cup final and my blood reading was 12.5, which I didn't want it to be. Uh, so I had an injection at half time, so I could bring it down to around about the 7 8 mark I wanted it to be at. Um, so, yes, an injection at half time in the cup final, but I didn't, you know, I don't really think about it. It was just something that I did. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, everyone, everyone watching, I mean, you've all got millions of stories of, you know, things that have happened, some funny, some not so funny, some downright depressing, uh, but we've all had them. Absolutely. Yeah, they've been a part of our experience. And I suppose now that we, you know, all of us have our own journeys to run, you probably wouldn't change it. I certainly from, you know, you were talking about it at the start, Gary, how it sort of, it might have even been the difference in your mindset, you know, it might have even driven you to the things that you've done. And, you know, in the things that you have done, you've inspired what I would say is a generation of people that play football with type one diabetes. You're probably, you, you may be aware, you may not be aware, but when, you know, me and John were growing up, I'm pretty sure that every hospital clinic up and down the country would have said, if you were remotely interested in football, you do know that Gary Mabbott's playing the Premier League. I remember it to this day. Now I was diagnosed probably just after you'd finished playing Gary. So it was 1999 for me. And, um, at that point, the nurses were saying, you, you know, you can go on and do it just like Gary did. And you look into that and it's, you know, it provides you with that moment when at the probably the darkest moment of being diagnosed, that first moment when you don't realize what is what this is, you're, you know, you're all of a sudden your whole life's changed before your eyes. That little spark of somebody else who's like you that has your interest, that's done what you want to do in life it just gives you that little bit of positivity to sort of look towards. And I just wondered with that, Gary, now, now we're in, you know, 2021, you've already talked about it, you know, in the 43 years that have passed since you were, you were diagnosed, we haven't seen another footballer with, um, with type one diabetes, make it into the top flight. We haven't seen another footballer with type one diabetes play for England since your example. Do you think that that's something that's become more difficult? Do you think we'll see another footballer? you know, make it to that level now? I certainly hope so. I mean, I've been quite disappointed in a way that, you know, when I was diagnosed, they said that you couldn't do it. Now, you know, I've often thought, what well, it's not really happened again since then, at, you know, for England or that level. And I, you, know, you think, well, was it just that I was a lucky one that I was able to manage it or... I didn't quite get it so bad, but more due respect, I've had a hell of a lot of bad times with it. So uh, I don't think, because uh, it, it is, it frustrates me that we haven't had a lot more high profile um, England players or you know, Premier League players. Uh, but it, there, there are players out there, but not quite managed that. Now, again, why that is, I've got absolutely no idea. Um, I mean, thank you for saying about the LC being the inspiration side of it. I've never thought of myself as, or never aimed myself at being somebody, oh, look at me, I inspire, look at what I do. It's never been me. Um, I never used diabetes to ever manipulate any situation to, whether it be from sponsorships or from medical companies or from, whereas if I had have done throughout my career, I could have got a lot of money from the company that was supplying my instinct. But why would I do that? Because then it'd be that somebody else is on a different instance and well, why am I on that? I, you, I never ever did that. So I've not taken any money from companies um, for promoting or being a diabetic. I don't think in a way that's right. Um, I can't say it, but there are other high profile people who have used it and get probably about 10 grand in appearance uh, for a diabetic appearance and uh i'll be there at the same appearance and i won't charge a penny um because i don't feel that's right uh you know your condition is something that you're trying to use as a as a way of doing that uh but, but that's just me um uh but we what we did do and uh, a company came to me and said look could we promote wanted to use me as an example but with the products that they had and Trying to think of the name of the company. 
oh, it'll come to me in a minute, a big uh, insulin supplying company. And they said, look, could we use you? We'll have you holding the insulin and taking pictures of you for a game or in the dressing room and all this. Um, and I said, well, actually, I took, and I said, look, what we can do. And I think if you, someone watching you may well have one, but a period of, I think it was four or five years in the early 80s, we had a massive, massive, like a, it opened up into a massive picture of me in England kit. Uh, and but we shut yeah. it up every page was a different one about diabetes, about your things, and this, and this company had their name on the back of it. And I said to them, Look, You provide me with a hundred thousand, what it was. And then we went, it was given out to every youngster of that era that was diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, if they were linked in with this hospital, or whatever, they would get one of these given to them, or their parents given to them when they were diagnosed, so they could, have, they could actually see what you're saying. This is somebody that, yeah, and they open up and there's a picture of me in my England kit uh, and all lots of pictures of me scoring goals or playing for Spurs. Um, so, yeah, so so we did that. So that worked really well. Um, so, I, think, I think I've got my copy in the loft at my mum and dad's. I, yeah. I had one. I had uh, one from well, the hospital. Well, yeah, so exactly. Well, that, yeah. that was done. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's how, yeah, I've always been positive. I've always been, uh, yeah, I do a, I'm Vice President of Diabetes UK, um, uh, and yeah, I'm always doing things. Uh, I've done quite a lot of things with different groups during this period uh, in lockdowns on remotely. Uh, generally, it's turning up at uh, sometimes the theatres, sometimes it's uh, hospitals and whatever. Um, I was a few years ago. I was literally I was a gentleman who obviously I don't know the guy, but uh, I think they had a diabetic child. Um, but their professors and things, they're having a massive professor conference down in, I think it was Falmouth, down in Cornwall. Um, and uh, this guy had a plane, so they pick, picked me up at a local airport, flew me down to Falmouth, uh, did this big conference um, for senior diabetic uh, professors and people involved in the, in the industry, uh, just to give your side of it and how things were and how you felt, what could be done. So, yeah, I mean, I enjoy doing those sort of things. Um, uh, that was, that, that, they're not normally quite as pampered as that. Normally, I've got to drive myself to, like, Carlisle and do it, but uh, not quite as... Uh, but, no, as I said, um, yeah, people always say to me, when they do mention to me, like, uh, just, just did there, um, yeah, it's always great to hear it. And I said, that's why all my letters used to get, and they used to reply, and they get a letter back from their parents saying, Thank you. You know, we were in a very bad time. I do a lot of phone calls to diabetics where I'll get uh, from Diabetes UK. We'll say, look, Gary, we have these privileges. Can you please call them? This lad's having a real big problem. Um, or mainly it's the family who are having a problem. Uh, so, you know, the family can't deal with it. Can you join in a, a conference call or whatever? So, yeah, I mean, yeah, all those things. Yeah, I've been lucky enough to be involved in you know, as captain of the club at Spurs for 11 years and, you know, the media side of it, uh, I like to think I'm quite up to date with uh, what they're trying to look for in questioning and how things go. Um, but no, as I say, it's, uh, um, yeah. I feel sometimes, you know, like all diabetics that I still, and I still will have it. You have a day where things aren't going quite as well as they, you want them to. The things aren't, suddenly you have a bit of a, you know, got a bit low, so you have to go and get stop somebody, go and get the biscuit uh, with a cup of tea. Uh, and yes, I'm sure like every single diabetic watching, I still have those days of why me? You know, why did it have to be me? Why me? Uh, yes, I still have those days even now. And I've had them throughout my whole life as a diabetic. Um, but they're, they're few and far between. Generally, uh, it's always been a, a far more positive um, yeah, people think, oh, you're also positive. No, there are times where I'm not so positive. They are the why me days. Um, but hopefully they're, as they say, they're, uh, they're very few and far between. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure Pete, you would say the same. You know, there's always these days where it happens as the why me's. I've certainly had a few of those. Um, 
dotted around, you know, sometimes playing football and, you know, you want it, or oh, for my case, futsal as well and where things go wrong and you think, ah, just why is it to me today, especially when you want a good performance or things like that. But yeah, um, I can really resonate with that, Gary. As to much of what you've said, you know, it's um, I can't obviously resonate with your experience at the top level in the sport, but certainly with your, you know, your life in general, there's so much, so many parallels to be drawn. And I just wanted to ask you sort of last question really is obviously now you've got these amazing roles with your, you know, your football club top in the hotspot. Uh, you've got Diabetes UK where you're the vice president as well. And just wanted to ask you really now, what sort of messages are you trying to get out there around diabetes? What would you say to people that are diagnosed? What would you say to people that are involved in, in the game more broadly around diabetes? Do you get a chance to sort of, um, raise awareness of the condition, maybe through Tottenham, for example, or, or through Diabetes UK? Yes, I mean, we have a lot of people still that uh, you know, write to the club and to me personally uh, about youngsters or families or uh, groups who are diabetics. Um, you know, we, we will cover it in our club program at times, do different things to cover things I've done with people, with the supporters. Um, and it's quite sort of fortunate, I suppose, I, I get quite a sort of a, a global sort of um, you know, because the way the game is now and uh, everything that happened back in the 80s is now available on every single person's iPhone or TV or whatever. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I get a lot of things from around the world about going on doing remote uh, thing. I've done a lot now with people, a uh, group down in Australia, um, one group in New Zealand, uh, Africa, America, uh, that, again, just want to have the same sort of chats that we're having. Um, I always, yeah, it's not that we say, but yeah, you, you always get this impression of being, oh, you know, wow, and it's, it's you know, okay, and this and that, and you're smiling. I always smile, even if I'm, if there's ever a time when I'm not feeling happy or there's something that's really trying to pull me down, I still smile. Because if you're smiling, you see somebody else and you're smiling, the smile on their face will, will help you pick you up. So I'm always, you know, trying to be on that side of it. As far as, my message has been the same since I was diagnosed. You know, no matter who you are, what you want to achieve in life, whether it be in sport, academics, business, workplace, whatever it is, you know, diabetes will not stand in your way. And I've always say that uh, you know, don't let don't let you live with your diabetes. You know, let your diabetes live with you. The way it is now, that's far easier than it was 43 years ago. Whether you can have your injections before your meals and have different meals at different times of day, etc. All that it's a lot easier with the, especially now with the Dexcoms, with the Libras, all those sort of things. Um, you know, it's far easier to to be able to be a diabetic. Um, what I will say is that as far as my roles, um, I do quite a lot of work with government, uh, trying to push things for the diabetic community. Currently, my big push is with the Libra. Um, an amazing machine, all the Dexcom, but amazing machines uh, that you can now get your phone, app on your phone, put it on your arm, give you a reading. Yeah, it's not as exact as blood testing, but it's good enough. Um, and the thing, it's amazing what people have. Now, if you've got a youngster with diabetes, middle of the night, your parents are always worried about their children. Why if they had a coma in the night? If they're concerned before they go to bed, all they've got to do is walk up to their child, put it on their arm, have a look, see what it is. In the night, it'll give them a it'll buzz if they're going too low. Uh, all these things could be done now. Um, and rather than having to wake the child up, prick their finger, take blood out, wake them up completely, sit them up. Now you just got to have this thing on your phone. Now, my part of the areas that I work, um, Libras are not free to everybody in this country yet. Now, it was initially only available to very few people. Now we're at the state whereby we've got them reduced. It used to be sort of if you're doing 10 blood tests a day on average, now and it's been reduced. We've got them now, they would give you a one of these Libras on the NHS. Now I think it's down to about eight blood tests a day, but it has to be proven. You can't just say, I do that. Yeah, with your sticks you've had over the years, your doctors, testing, etc. Now we've got them down to eight. Um, they will look at having a Libra for that for that person. We're aiming to get them down to six and then aiming to get them to everybody available. So I don't have a Libra or a Dexcom. I still prick my finger purely because I've told them until it's available to every single diabetic 
in this country, I'm not going to have one. It's not fair. Why should it be that being me, the companies will give them to me free and yet somebody that really needs it for their child, they can't get it. They have to pay 180 quid a month, whatever it is, to have one. That's not acceptable. Uh, so, yes, I'm still on. Same thing with the um, pumps. Pumps aren't available to everybody yet in this country. So I don't have a pump. I still have the plastic needle. I still have the bottles of insulin. In fact, uh, sitting here, be right by my side, as it always is. My nice bag. There we go. My needles, my insulin, always carried. Goes to me with games, to matches, in my bags. Wherever I go, this goes with me. So it carries my sweets, my everything I need with it. So yes, um, those areas I, I work with now uh, as well. I go around the country doing a lot of um, last over, overseas. It was Norway to do a talk on diabetes uh, in a conference there. So yes, um, it's uh, yeah, it does take up you know, time in your life, but uh, um, yeah, I've had a great life with diabetes. Uh, it has had to live with me. Because uh, there's no way that I could live with the, you know, if I took over it how it should be, it's never been. My playing days were very different to what a normal diabetic should look like, given that we have kickoffs at three in the afternoon, seven thirty in the evening, whatever, um, midday kickoffs. So yes, everything's had to be worked on, uh, but again, it does become part of your second nature. Uh, I had a heart bypass last year, so they they now put me on seven injections a day. I have to get up every morning at three o'clock in the morning to do a blood test and um, normally an injection because for some reason that we've done so many tests to work it out is that my sugars tend to raise dramatically around about sort of two, three in the morning. Uh, we don't, don't quite know why, what that's happened in the last few years, but it has. So I now get up every morning, do my seventh injection at three in the morning. Um, but, you know, it does become second nature. Although, as I say, if you actually sit down and ask me the question, you know, yes, I go a day without it happily. Um, but by being like we are, if you are disciplined, I've seen so many diabetes go off the rail, so many problems, so many bad situations you know, that can lead to no longer being here because of conditions that people have abused. Um, well, I do say, people, if you are a diabetic and you want to make the best of your life, you have to be disciplined. Yes, you can have the occasional blast on a, go out for a massive curry, have a few beers. Have, yeah, occasionally, yes. Christmas Day, just had it with Easter weekend. Easter week, weekend, I probably have probably uh, nine, ten injections a day because my daughter, they're, they're, they're things, they're things, like, actually, I would like to have a, a mini egg or a piece of their dairy milk chocolate. And I will. You know, it's more, it's easier now to do that. Uh, but it's the occasional day or a couple of days. With, um, you, know, you don't have to. With youngsters now, they say, well, uh, before a game, what do I do? I used to say, I used to have a glucose drink or dextrose salt tablets. No. Now, before a game, when they're playing as a youngster, what's, what's your favourite sweet? Oh, I used to love Mars bar. Have a Mars bar. Have, a, have half a Mars bar before the game. Have half a Mars bar at half time. And then, then they get to enjoy their Mars bar, have a treat, and they get to play football. Uh so, yeah, I mean, it's far easier being a diabetic now, but it's no different to as it was 43 years ago, as far as you still have to be as disciplined and as in control over you, of yourself. I think you, you've summed up there with a, a lot of what you said as to why, um, for me, growing up, you were, you were such an inspiration. Um, I, I remember the day that my mum and dad... Um, so I was diagnosed mid 80s, age five. And when they discovered that you were also diabetic, um, it sort of gave that extra, oh, wow, do you know what? I, I can still lead a normal life and and just sort of followed. And and, and the way that, like you've mentioned, that, that you made sure you replied to every letter that you, you used to do the, or you, that you do these public appearances and, and promoting it and saying, look, you can lead a normal life. You can still do this. Don't let it stand in your way. And, and, and the positive message that you always give out, even though, like you said, even though you might not want to, even though you you might be having an absolute stinker of a day, just massive thank you from me for the, the impact that that your, your positivity had on me growing up as well. And 
I used to I, I used to take real pride in in telling everyone that you were my favourite player because we but we were both diabetic. It was it, it really was that that just amazing role model that that, that you were. And I'm, I'm getting a bit emotional now, so sorry. Oh, no. I'll pass so, uh, it back over to Chris. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, it's very kind of you say, as I said, uh, people say these sort of things to me. Yeah, it, it means a lot because you know I've never say considered myself as being that big, but you know, the amount of people that you get all throughout my life have said things like that. And it's uh you know to think that this is yeah, this what happening is happening uh because of what you're doing, it's it's great. Uh let's say it's never been something which um I mean I don't know, it's maybe a strange thing to say, but we'll say you will how much you change in your life? Yeah, you, know, you what you did, people they change from being suddenly your yeah, you know, top star in football player for your country and your nightclub didn't let you do party and all this and that and everything goes with it. But yeah, you know, I've just been lucky in that I like to think that I, I, the same person leaving grammar school when I was 16 is the same person inside that I am now. I don't feel that you know, I was not a, never a person that uh, um, you know, did all the, uh, you did, did a lot of things, but not, not things that I believe that really uh, changed me. And I think you can only be sort of true to yourself and whatever. And I was lucky that I did have a, a strong, I think, determination um and i think that drive to when you were told negativity when i was younger that well actually let's see i mean it could have been quite easy to just given up completely and uh not gone with it um but no i say it's uh everyone that's diagnosed it's a massive problem for them and for their families even today even though things are a lot easier it's still a massive change to people's lives the concern there are the concerns for us you know what will happen in the future when i was first diagnosed they told me that complications in the future if you're not well controlled they tell me that maybe you know everything if you're not well controlled or they couldn't actually state i know some people that are the best controlled diabetics in the world and unfortunately have had limbs amputated but people who are the disgraceful diabetics out partying every week and they're like living the life of Riley yeah you know, not quite you know there are things you can say do this and I always say look be controlled be disciplined be this be that yes occasionally you have a blast and that's always seemed to work for me um but no one can actually dictate as to what you know if you do this if you do that what is going to happen I think I've been as well controlled as I have been and when I was first diagnosed I said look complications you know kidney problems circulatory problems you know this and that and going on and um eye problems you know, i had an eye you know i've had eye problems but then it's been uh yeah it's still being managed but it's it's good um and but i was told then that you know, obviously circulation amputate and remember telling me then when i was you know 43 years ago that just hit me my god that that's something that could really happen and i suppose in the back of my head you've always had those worries the concerns um and then of course uh, three four years ago um when suddenly overnight basically my circulation just stopped completely going to my left leg um and i was going to the hospital and they just said straight away look we're fighting to save your leg and i was just like excuse me what what's happened um and yes yeah those things can happen but there are far worse things that happen to other people fortunately after a seven hour operation they managed i've got a scar from my groin down to my foot managed to get the uh, a vein that was long enough to be able to reach. They managed, the guy said, normally they have at least a centimetre. They said, okay, we had about four or five millimetres to play with to actually get it to attach. And you think, my goodness, I could have woken up, you know. And, but unfortunately, it's what life throws at you. No matter what it throws at you, there are going to be many curved balls, no matter whether you're a diabetic or not. And uh, it's how you deal with those curved balls that, is the person that you're going to become and i think that positivity of it all yes i have concerns like everybody the heart bypass last year i just w went in just, just for a test and suddenly they said well gary your main artery is virtually blocked you got to rush you in and you know excuse me i was only a tiny bit out of breath uh but i would say that any diabetic or any person basically i'm a person i don't like i'm not making an issue of anything but 
if I've got something that I don't understand, if I get suddenly a pain here or there, I am the first person to call my professors uh, and say, I need to see you. You know, any, anything that's not quite right, get in there, get it checked, because the sooner any complication is found, the sooner it can be dealt with. And uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll all live a, a long and a prosperous life. Uh, but the most important thing is to, you know, as I say, never let diabetes hold you back. No matter what you want to do, it won't. Wow. Uh, great words, Gary, and really appreciate, um, you know, your time coming on to the, the podcast with us today to talk about, you know, your experiences. And for me, I know it's even more personal for, for John to have you on the, the show with us. Um, for me, it's obviously very personal as well. Your, your name, your, um, your experiences, your being a role model for us with, with type one diabetes has meant an awful lot over the years. And, and I know you're very humble with it as you've come across today. And, and before this, you know, we knew that about you anyway. Um, but it really, really does hit home, you know, how incredible your experiences were and what you've done in the game. And um, talking to you today, today has been, you know, uh, an incredible experience for both of us. So just want to say a huge thank you for being that inspiration for both of us and not just for both of us, for everybody within the diabetes community that will listen to this, hopefully, and feel that warmth that inspiration and that most of all that positivity that you've shared today around how to you know go about diabetes and you know 43 years later Gary we're still talking about your incredible journey um with the condition and what you've demonstrated that you know this this thing that we we all have you know is um is not going to stand in your way so just again from me really real big thank you and um yeah wish you all the best and hopefully we will catch up again very very soon yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, guys, no, it's been a pleasure to be on. And, uh, you know, Chris Pe Peachy, it's been great to be on with you and uh, hear your stories. And uh, say, you made it very easy for me. So thank you very much.